Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Can I ask you a huge favor? This is my first in-person presentation in over two years, and I want to see your faces. If you could all just get up and move closer to me, that would make me feel a lot better because it's been a long time since we've all been together, and I do want to see your smiling faces up close. So please do come in and fill in. Now, I apologize for us getting started a little late as if we are here at a hacker conference. I guess it's a professional hacker conference, but we're gonna cover a bunch of things that have been dear to my heart, important to me, not just bug bounties, but a little bit of labor rights, a little bit of capitalism, a little bit of the way that we treat each other. So I'm thanking you for being on this journey with me, and let's get started. So this is not your grandson's bug bounty. They said the clicker would work. They told me the clicker would work. They promised this clicker would work, and apparently it does not work. All right. We'll just have to do it this way. So how do most people spend their lives? There's a lot of time sleeping, it turns out, and plenty of time working, and you have to cram in everything else, fun, eating, sex, everything, hobbies, into the rest of the time you have left. Hackers spend their time a little bit differently. I don't know, this is allegorical experience, but essentially we spend very little time sleeping and doing everything else versus hacking. And I've been a hacker my whole life. My mom had to remove all the screwdrivers from my house and I figured out butter knives work just as well. So I'm always looking for creative ideas to problem, or creative ways to solve problems and new ideas. So how many of you are familiar with the parable of the long spoons? Okay, I'm gonna tell you the parable of the long spoon. So the setup is what you see there. It is a table that is too large to reach the food in the middle, but everybody has long spoons so they can reach the food. But when they try to feed themselves, hilarity and tragedy ensues and people are miserable and starving. So what does this have to do with system dynamics? Well, some of you who are familiar with my previous work and research know that we live in complex systems. Think of it like the butterfly effect. A little effect here has a profound effect elsewhere. And when I first became accustomed to looking at things from a system dynamics perspective, it was to try to answer the question, should we just outbid the black market on bugs, right? Would that be a viable strategy? And this question was first posed to me um, in the form that I understood it in, as it applied to our industry and bug bounties by Dan Gear when he gave a keynote speech. So one of the things that I had done with research colleagues was looked at the system dynamics of the vulnerability economy and exploit market and tried to answer that question. Could you just pay higher prices and outbid the offense market is what I like to call it because Black market implies a lot of things that are not cool, but also it implies that it's illegal. Um, the offense market is not illegal, and there are reasons why it shouldn't be illegal, but I can go into that during Q&A if you're really curious. However, we did answer the question dur during our research of whether or not it made sense to try and buy out the vulnerability market by raising prices, and it turned out that lever was the least efficient lever to tipping the balance from defense or from offense to defense. The lever that was the most effective that we found wasn't price. It was actually whether or not you could close the tooling gap in not identifying vulnerabilities, but identifying exploitability. Because lots of the tools are similar. However, the exploitability will determine, one, its value to the offense market, and two, the urgency of the defense market to try and fix it. So let's go into the talk itself. Ooh, now the clicker works, but it works backwards. Hold on. All right, backwards is better than not working at all. So what are we gonna cover in this briefing? We're gonna talk about some of the problems that I've seen occurring over the last decade of modern bug bounties. We'll go into a brief history of bug bounties, exploitation of labor and a few bugs, what hackers and organizations deserve in terms of better outcomes on both sides of this marketplace, and some ideas for what's next for hackers, for organizations, and the security industry as a whole. We also have a surprise announcement to make, and we'll wrap it all up by telling you the punchline of the long spoon story. 
So what is the problem that we've been observing? You know, I'm a big believer in bug bounties. I like bug bounties, and I cannot lie. But the fact is, they have not delivered on their great promise. We wanted them to have revolutionary security benefits. We wanted to keep hackers out of jail and get them paid, but ideally a consistent, livable wage. And we also wanted to help build the cyber workforce pipeline of tomorrow. And unfortunately, it hasn't delivered on all these promises. But I think there's still hope. Because why? We know why. There isn't one size that fits all. And the key here is organizational maturity. You know, you can tell an organization all you want about their security vulnerabilities. But if they don't have the capacity to fix them and fix them consistently, they will always be falling behind. And other priorities will always take more precedence than the security priorities. So what we really need to do is organize around the evolving maturity of each side of this marketplace and think of it in terms of system dynamics. So let's talk about some solutions. This talk is going to probably lend itself to some interesting questions. I will try to leave time for questions at the end, but we did get a little bit of a late start, so I'll do my best. Okay, what's happened so far in bug bounties? Well, everybody knows that they didn't start with Hack the Pentagon. They started actually many, many years earlier with a concept from Don Newth when he published his book, and he would pay out one hexadecimal dollar for any kind of error that was in that book. So it wasn't strictly about software bugs. It was about any kind of bug. It could be an editorial issue or a typo. And then in 1995, Mozilla came out with a $500 bug bounty for security bugs, and that was sort of one of the first true security bug bounties. Nothing was really happening under the bug bounty sun until Google resurrected this idea in order to bounty their brand new at the time, Chrome browser. And it made perfect sense for them to do so. Why? They didn't have a legacy code base to support. They wanted to try and surface as many bugs in as short a period of time while they were still building Chrome as possible. And so it was very low risk for them to not only offer a bug bounty, but make it almost three times higher than the going rate of bug bounties at the time. That same year in 2010, they raised the prices yet again to over $3,000. So suddenly, this question of can we outbid the black market, the offense market, suddenly became much more viable. And everybody started asking me, who was working at Microsoft at the time, when is Microsoft going to start paying for bugs? Well, unfortunately, the VPs and executives at Microsoft at the time had sworn publicly that they would never, ever pay for vulnerabilities. Now, there's a good reason for that at the time. Um, back then and even now, they are still the largest intake funnel of vulnerability reports in the world, probably in the world combined, quite frankly. They receive over 250,000 to 300,000 non-spam email messages a year of people trying to report vulnerabilities to Microsoft for free. So why would you dangle cash in front of a fire hose like that? Right? They had no idea that there were ways in which we could structure the bug bounties to make it beneficial for both sides. So when I created Microsoft's bug bounties in 2013, we launched not just with the highest bug bounty of any industry uh, vendor in the world at the time, we launched with specific strategic security goals and outcomes in mind. We were already getting bugs for free. So we started looking at when we were getting those bugs. We got some of those bugs after the beta period of products were over. Why? Because the only thing a hacker could get was 10-point aerial font, their name, credit in a bulletin. So unfortunately, they would hold on to their vulnerabilities during the entire beta period, the best time to receive vulnerability reports, and they would spike with a, with a huge deluge of cases right after the product was out of beta. So what I suggested to the IE team at the time, rest in peace, Internet Explorer, you are a wonderful uh, tool to download Chrome. Um, but what I told to the, uh, the head of IE at the time was, look, you can align your engineering bug fixing effort with the security discovery of bug hunters in the world. If you just put a bug bounty at the beginning of the beta period, we can shift the traffic to the best time for both, both sides. They get credit, they get a little bit of money, and you get the bugs at the earliest time possible to maximize the number of bugs that you're fixing. 
we absolutely reversed the trend, and that was one of the key things that took bug bounties into the modern age. The $100,000 bug bounty went to my friend James Forshaw, and that was also unique in the, at the time in the industry. It wasn't just looking for a proof of concept, latest exploit, it was looking for a brand new exploitation technique, because those are the things that would take the platform the longest to adapt to. So after that, it seemed that some bug bounty platforms that had been around for a couple of years suddenly had a viable market. So after the Microsoft bug bounty launched in 2013, that's when we saw the Series A investments coming into the bug bounty platform. So that was when they got their big boost, big pushes, and that's when I joined one of them with the great hope that we were going to be addressing all of these problems that we were seeing. So, I had been invited to a guest lecture at Harvard Kennedy School, MIT Sloan School. In that audience was my friend Michael Sulmeyer, who at the time was um, head of cybersecurity policy for the Office of the Secretary of Defense. I was asked to brief the Pentagon. Fast forward, two years later, we launched not only the very first bug bounty program of the US government, but we launched the very first program where the US government was actually inviting to engage directly with the hacker community on finding bugs in its systems. That was a monumental point in time. And after that, in the years since, we've seen so many organizations jump on the bug bounty wagon, but so many before they're ready. So many before they have ironed out the internal processes needed to actually fix the vulnerabilities. So, I don't know how many of you follow me on Twitter, but the other day I decided to take my life in my hands and say yes to the driverless ride from Lyft. And uh, I took a couple photos, but I was expecting like a car to show up with no people in it. There were two people in it, the driver and the observer to help the, the whole experience along. So what's funny about the bug bounty platforms now is that you see them investing more and more in additional bug discovery through AI, ML, et cetera. And what I'm telling you here is that not only you know, are driverless vehicles pretty far from being useful and truly driverless, we are still in that state as well. So if you're looking to AI and machine learning to help you through some of these process problems, look no further than the human being who you actually need to train um, to do this work. So what are the three most common things that we've found and we've observed over the course of watching bug bounties and vuln disclosure programs grow up in this industry. So the vulnerability coordination maturity model is a free framework that I developed based on observation of five capability areas that were key to understanding where are the weak points? What are the basic minimum capabilities in each of these areas in order to, to survive? a constant influx of vulnerabilities whose disclosure you may not necessarily be able to choose, right? It's an, it's an unsteady and semi-unpredictable workflow. And to handle it, you have to have capabilities in these areas. So what have we observed about what are the most important capabilities, the key predictors of success or failure of these bug bounty programs? Well, organizational commitment. You have to commit to fixing the bugs. You would not believe how many organizations we see that are performing what I call bug bounty Botox, right? They launch a bug bounty, and it might even be in private mode, and they check a box saying they have one, and they literally use the platform terms of non-disclosure to lock all those bugs away. They might pay for them, but they're not fixing them, right? So there's no organizational commitment at that level to actually fix the bugs. What does that come down to? Does that come down to just more engineers? Well, you know, Microsoft has a few engineers, I would say, but every second Tuesday of the month, we can see that more engineers doesn't make it so that you have no bugs or fewer bugs. There are process pieces, roles and duties, and even some tools internally that are missing. And it's not just about the security development life cycle. It's actually about processing the vulnerability reports, using the metrics that you get from running these programs and having that shape your intelligence of just not just response, but of how you're going to make your security investments in the future. And what I've noticed, so last year I hacked Clubhouse. I didn't mean to, it was a hack totally. Hack happen. 
And what happened was I tried to report a vulnerability. It took me a couple of weeks even to find the right point of contact. And they weren't responding to me even when I did until I had to send them a video of myself presenting the five stages of vulnerability response grief um, so that they could kind of get over the denial, the anger, you know, the bargaining, et cetera, and get to acceptance so that we could work together. I also had to send them a video of me walking through the international standards for vulnerability disclosure and vulnerability handling processes, explain I was a co-author and co-editor, and that I was going to drop Ode on them if they didn't respond. So you shouldn't have to threaten to dis publicly disclose, and you certainly shouldn't have to be one of the two co-editors of the ISO standards on how to do this to get an organization's attention. And what I found out when I tried to report these vulnerabilities to Clubhouse was that they had a bug bounty. It was private. They tried to get me to report through that bug bounty platform, to which I refused. Why? Because I don't accept the disclosure terms that would require me to keep silent if they don't fix it. So I just explained to them, no, nope, we're going to stay in email, and you know, I'm going to give you, you know, a reasonable amount of time to fix it. Happy to test your fixes, but we are, you know, unless you have an engineering reason to delay, um, I will, I will disclose this to the public because the clubhouse vulnerabilities I found were where you could basically um, end up being a silent listener or disruptor with no way to kick you out, even by the, by the moderators, because you were invisible. I called it banshee bombing for the noisy ghost um, version, and uh, you know, and and um, I called it something else reasonable. Oh, poltergeist, something like that. Anyway, the point is, I tried to tell them they had a flawed intake process. They tried to shuffle me off into a bounty program, a bounty platform that would have forced non-disclosure, and in fact, when I finally talked to one human, it was one of the founders, and I asked him you know, why did this bug exist in the first place? You know, this was kind of a basic session and validation issue, you know, should have come up in your testing. And, um, you know, it's, it's clear you're missing some pieces in your security development life cycle. And he said, no, we're, we're building it securely. And we have this bug bounty program. And I said, you know, how many security people do you have? And he said, well, it's, it's, it's actually, it's me who's handling it. This was one of the co-founders of Clubhouse. So there they were, a unicorn valuated company that at the time was being entertained to be bought by Twitter for $4 billion was the number that was floating around. And I also found out they had fewer employees at that company than I have at my company. So that's the kind of audience that we've got all excited to start bug bounties, but they're using them inconsistently. They're lacking some of the basic capability areas, and in some instances, they're just lacking the humans. Now, let's talk about how the gig economy exploits labor. When I was at Microsoft, of course we performed labor law checks, not just with Microsoft lawyers, but with outside counsel. And it was determined that bug bounties, in fact, do violate labor laws but that it was relatively low risk that a class action lawsuit would occur. Fast forward, the gig economy has become famous with rideshare apps, delivery apps, et cetera. And those companies have spent a ton of money lobbying against fair labor practices in their area. One thing I want to caution our industry with is that if we don't come up with different and better ways to engage with gig labor that is more fair, our industry will capitulate to the same forces that are successfully driving the decrease in labor rights across delivery drivers, across rideshare drivers, and all the other areas of the gig economy. So why did I start a bug bounty program if it violates labor laws and I care about labor? Well, because the way that we were structuring these, they were still win-win for everyone, right? We were doing things in a way that there were very few bug collisions, right? So the problem with bug bounties in that you can find the exact same bug as someone else, but if you're not the first to report it, you get zero. That's definitely worse than a Lyft or an Uber ride, right? At least when they accept a ride and they do the work, they will get paid. Not so with bug bounty hunters. So. We had a way of structuring these things, and we had a problem set that didn't lend itself to so many of the exploity areas of exploiting people, more exploiting bugs. 
So in the industry writ large, is it worth it though, right? Are people getting enough of what they need out of this, this economy to make it worth it because bug bounties are making us more secure? Well, not so much. So how many of you heard about a big Coinbase bug bounty payout? It was like a quarter million dollars coming out of Coinbase. This happened earlier this year. That's a lot of money. Must have been a big bug. It was an API with no authentication that was reported, right? So why would they spend $250,000 on a very obvious class of bug that should have been prevented elsewhere? And why are we not noticing as an industry that these basic bugs are the ones that are getting higher and higher payouts as a whole? A lot of security theater going on. So while bug bounties have a lot of good energy, right? I can't thank the bug bounty platforms enough for the fact that they've made it easy for us to explain the benefit of a well-done bug bounty. I can't thank them enough for having gotten so many hackers involved in thinking that they might be able to make a living this way. But this great strength and this reach is really leading us to a dark side without discipline. So, the numbers of bugs that are being reported keep increasing. We're seeing more and more duplicates being reported because the low-hanging fruit is not being taken care of appropriately internally. Bug bounty programs themselves, by themselves, cannot fix an organization's lack of commitment or lack of security people who are in specialized roles. These are not the developers who wrote the buggy code in the first place. You can't just solve this with adding more developers. There are security processes that are specific to what I call the internal digestive system of bugs. You get bug indigestion with a lot of these bug bounty programs. So what's next? There is a better way forward for the labor market, for better security outcomes, and we will be announcing a bounty as well. So, I'm gonna give you some news you can use right away. First of all, I've complained about the bug bounty platforms requiring NDAs. I do not believe that bug bounties should require an NDA. Why? Because they're just a paid thank you on top of a vulnerability disclosure process. Why would I ever sign an NDA for the privilege of telling you what's wrong with you? That's insane, right? But, it's a fair contract if it's a penetration test. So how do we hybridize these models in the work that we do to make it win-win for both sides of the equation? When I joined Microsoft, there was a program already in place called Tango. So we do still call it Tango today um, in, in our work. And what that means is, you know, Tango is an intimate dance, one-on-one. -on -one. And what it means is getting an individual researcher under penetration testing contract to perhaps explore a certain class of vulnerabilities or deliver you know, on an ongoing basis anything that they find under contract. That is a fair use of an NDA because the researcher is definitely getting paid. Now, you begin to think, well, they get paid even if they find nothing. Not the way that we've been implementing them. So let the duplicates be your guide. Any of you running bug bounty programs and have a researcher submit one bug, get paid, and then submit a similar bug, a duplicate, but on a different endpoint? Raise your hands. Yes. So we look at those kinds of cases, and it seems very obvious to us that this researcher has a methodology, perhaps even a tool, that they could actually point and, and identify all the instances of that same vulnerability on different endpoints. So we reach out to them and we ask them, are you open to a limited time-bound pen testing contract simply to enumerate all of the instances of that bug on all the endpoints you can find? Now, while they may make less in theory than if they got paid out individually for each one, most bug bounty programs will not pay out individually for each one. At best, they'll pay you know, maybe the first couple and then after that just say, the rest of them are duplicates. We're not gonna pay you anymore. There's also the matter of when does the hacker get paid? So this solves a few problems, right? Both sides of the marketplace benefit. Both sides walk away getting what they need and what they want. So yeah, why not both? By the way, that meme, that is the grown-up 
actual actress um, in that meme. And so what I'm saying here is that this part of the industry definitely needs to grow up. It's always been a false dichotomy of saying that the, you could only have many eyes working on the problem if you do it bug bounty wise, or you can only have a safe bug bounty to run if you impose NDAs. Well, I think that there's a hybrid model. We've made it work. And every party has walked away happier, with more predictable results, with more efficient results on both sides. And this is something that, you know, honestly, we should be doing across the board. So here's some more news you can use right now. Most organizations cannot count. When we go in and we ask them, and we're doing a vulnerability coordination maturity model assessment, rolls off the tongue. When we're doing this, they can't count. We ask them how many security vulnerabilities they have. They're sort of saying, well, we have this many, you know, bug crowd cases or hacker one cases. And I'm like, right, so how many of those identify to one root cause? How many of those are, you know, uh, had to be reopened, you know, et cetera? They find that when we ask them these, what seem like basic metrics questions, they haven't been counting. They've just been chasing fixes, right? So metrics that you should be thinking about, whether you are thinking about starting a vuln disclosure program or a bug bounty, or you're already running one. Start looking at your mean time to repair. How long does it take you to fix critical cases on average and the lower severity cases? How many duplicates? Now, bug bounty platforms will tell you the overall duplicate rate. They will not tell you necessarily the per bug duplicate rate. Why does that matter? Why does that matter to us? Because how many individual finders are able to identify the same exact bug should tell you how discoverable it is and potentially how exploitable it is. So let's say it's a low severity bug, but so many researchers are reporting it, that should increase your urgency to fix that bug. That should change your response time. That should put the relevant criticality of getting that work done in context-aware perspective. This is something, again, that the bug bounty service providers and the platforms are not doing right now, which is why organizations and governments keep coming to us to have them untangle this and figure out how can we be more efficient and stop chasing whack -a bug so other useful metrics that you should think about, how often in your organization are cases having to be reopened? That indicates that you are not understanding the root cause or applying a comprehensive fix or testing the fix, et cetera, right? This is another opportunity for Tango, for example. If you have a researcher that comes back with a bypass to your fix and you try again and they come back with another bypass to your fix, that would be a tango candidate, right? Percentage of cases with the same root cause, this, op this identifies opportunities for you to retrain your developers, perhaps introduce different tooling in your development lifecycle. There are so many efficiencies that you're missing just because you don't have the data. And then finally, bug fixing is really, it's a relay race. And you need to know who's dropping the baton. When you start actually measuring some of these outcomes and some of the places in the process that get stalled or have to be relitigated and redone, that's when you can identify, you know what? It's this one product team that's understaffed or they need more training. It's this, or, it's this organization over here that you know, we thought we were uh, giving them adequate repro steps and in information, but apparently we weren't, and we need to up our game as security practitioners to help the developers understand. Also, it can be from your bug bounty platform itself. Unfortunately, over the years, as these platforms is, have aged, we've noticed, you know, in the beginning, there were, were no real differences between triage and any kind of delays there. We're seeing a big divergence at this point as more of these programs are becoming commoditized. And so watch your bug bounty platform providers for them dropping the baton, for them missing their SLAs, inaccurate triage, the kinds of things that will make your program not work efficiently and also give you a bad reputation among the researchers that you're trying to integrate with. Okay. So you've got the metrics, now what do you do? 
You know, I often say that we're kind of like Dr. House and we give a diagnosis based on the bugs that we see, the number and type and severity of bugs and the trending of your bugs. So understanding your vulnerability handling process is more important and understanding it at this moment in time is more important than how much bug bounty money you've spent or even how many bugs you got. Because the trend you're looking for is you need to go from lots of low hanging fruit, lots of duplicates, easy to discover vulnerabilities, to fewer and fewer, more complex, harder to find, requiring higher skills, because that is an indication that you are getting more mature in your security practices. So open up pen test contracts, especially to some of bug bounty hunters that have tools. Make a Tango program of your own. This is also a way to potentially identify talent, but just understand that knowing is less than half the battle. When I was a pen tester in the early 2000s, I got sick of it because we were coming back year after year, quarter after quarter, and we could basically just change the data on the report. All the bugs were still open. Why? Because they didn't have enough people in different security roles internally to fix these issues and to systematically eradicate them from future software development. The other thing uh, that I have to say is that in 2008, Popular Science called the job Microsoft Security Grunt among the top 10 worst jobs in science. It was between elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. It was like right in the middle there. And that was accurate. We got t-shirts. It was amazing. But plan for cyber workforce attrition in some of these key process roles. When we try to staff organizations and fill in the gaps for them, on these key internal security program manager roles, we tell them that, look, you can actually, uh, if you want, we have the opposite of a no poaching clause in our contract. We say, you can poach these contractors and offer them full-time jobs. You just flip the badge color on them you know, once, once our engagement is done. Why do we do this? Because we know that it's among the worst jobs in science and there's gonna be a high attrition rate. And so once people get really good at these jobs, after a couple of years, they wanna move on. So plan for this in your own cyber workforce. Do not try to make your developers wear all of these bug bounty hats, program management hats, et cetera, because what you will find is that about the 18 month or two year mark of running a bug bounty program, internally, you will lose key people and the program will collapse under its own weight. So just understand that fixing bugs themselves is treating the symptoms of your underlying security problems. Fixing your process is the cure and anticipating the places where your process is gonna need help. So one thing we're happy to announce, I was recently at the White House for a Cyber Workforce and Education Summit. I don't know if you can see me in that picture. That, um, but what was interesting about that summit was they announced a cybersecurity apprenticeship sprint. So the federal government, state, and territory governments have, cyber, have apprenticeship programs where they work with companies and they work with them on developing apprentice, apprenticeships for those companies so that you can hire and train the workforce of tomorrow. They announced an accelerator program and we have uh, started the process of actually creating cyber workforce apprenticeship problems. This is exactly the way we've had to hire this whole time. We hire contractors and then we get them trained because you know what? Not that many people wanna have this job ever again once they've had it. So there's not a huge workforce to choose from, but there is a workforce of people who need experience in cybersecurity and can't qualify for the job listings that we see so often requiring 10 years of expert experience. This is the other thing we're announcing. We have been a bootstrapped startup since the beginning. I did toy with the idea of getting VC cash, but all they wanted to do was fund my company to make another bug bounty platform. Who needs another one of those? What they didn't understand was that I wanted to make a broader workforce platform. So what are we doing now? The fact of the matter is we do end to end manage bug bounty services where we're the ones who are deciding which bug bounty platform to work with. We are hiring the bug bounty platforms and directing them in order to get the deliberate security outcomes that our customers need. 
but we've never spent one dollar on sales and marketing. So why wouldn't I crowdsource that? I mean, come on, incentives are my thing, right? So the fact of the matter is, as long as it's not illegal for you to collect a referral fee, we're offering referral fees to anyone who understands the concept of what we're doing and knows of an organization that desperately needs this kind of help. So maturity actually matters. Where you are today in your program, you may be flying high, but again, when key personnel leave, your process may collapse. So you actually have to be deliberate about building maturity and sustaining that maturity over time. Bug bounties are fantastic, but they can't be used as Botox, covering up your internal security flaws. You've gotta be pretty on the inside. So don't use them in isolation. Don't use them when you don't have security personnel to deal with these issues. You can, use, you can have a vuln disclosure program. I'm not saying you know, don't listen to the, the community and have no way to report vulns. I'm just saying that a bug bounty and trying to control the outcome by non-disclosure agreements, it's not the way. VCs aren't bad people, but they've been grown in the petri dish of capitalism as we all have been. And I would say that capitalism as it's practiced today, it's like the Kobayashi Maru, you know, the rules are not meant for most of us to win. So we've got to change the rules. We've, we're hackers, right? Or at least some of us are. The final thing is that we should be deliberately working towards finding more exploits for bugs, not finding ways to exploit people. There is a way to harness the power of hackers without exploiting their labor. And finally, I promised you the end of the long spoons game. So the parable goes, there's another room with the exact same setup. But that exact same setup, everyone's behaving differently. They're feeding each other. It's the difference between heaven and hell. We have all the tools. Every person in this room is highly privileged. Your spoons are long. Your days might be short. Do you have any questions? <laughs>